Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I so I've I've seen Jennifer give this presentation, and this is absolutely one of my favorite uh, talks that I've seen, and that and that includes every talk I've seen, not just the ones Jennifer has done. Uh, this is a fun one. Uh, when Jennifer brought it to us and said, "Hey, this is my idea. I've got this great thing, and I'm going to do this," and I, I. I, it wasn't that I was against the idea. I wasn't a hundred percent sure how it would work. I thought it was a great idea, but I wasn't sure how it would work. And and no pressure, but it did. And um, so uh, I want to just say thank you everybody for joining. I hope you all enjoy this as much as I did the first time I saw it. Um, and I'm going to turn this over to Jennifer and let her talk to you about uh, cheese, which is. One of my favorite things. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, everybody loves cheese. Um, and I say this as somebody who is myself lactose intolerant. I still love cheese. I don't care how much it hurts me. <laughs> so um, the real purpose behind today's talk is, first of all, I'm going to tell an interesting story, or at least what I believe to be an interesting story. And I do promise that there's probably going to be a point in this talk that you're going to think, what exactly where are we going with this where is this leading to and i do promise it does kind of circle back around it is cybersecurity eventually but i i need to tell this story at the beginning so that we can really set up some of the concepts later on before we dive into that though i'm going to go ahead and give a real quick introduction on myself um since you guys are here for one of the secure ideas webinars i do believe you are at least vaguely familiar with secure ideas I am one of our senior security consultants. We are headquartered out of Jacksonville, Florida, and I am one of the people that lives in Jacksonville, Florida. So I go to the uh, office almost every day. Uh, whenever I, I have been doing pen testing now, I want to say for about eight years or so. But uh, as an ADHD person, time is ephemeral. I have a really hard time tracking how long something's actually been. When I started in cybersecurity, I did start as a SOC analyst at a managed seam. So at the very beginning, I was blue team. Um, I did eventually move into a position where I was reverse engineering malware, doing some research there and threat intelligence and pen testing uh, web applications the other half of the time. Eventually, I got to a point where I was just ready to do just pen testing. Some other interesting facts about me, though, is, well, I'm an all-around geek. I don't know if you can really see what all is behind me right now. I do have a large collection of Fallout memorabilia. I also have quite a few anime figures. Um, just an all-around nerd. Uh, I am a lockpick enthusiast. For anybody who might be interested, I am the co-leader for the Jacksonville Chapter of Tool, which is the organization of open locks. It's a, uh, a lockpick group. We meet on the second Friday of every month in Jacksonville. But if you're not in Jacksonville and you're still interested in learning about how to lockpick, I do recommend checking out to see if there's any chapters near you. And last but certainly not least, uh, one of my pastimes is reading NTSB and FAA investigation reports, which is um, something that kind of surprises a lot of people because they don't necessarily seem like something that's enthralling reading material, but I very much uh, like the, the flow of how these accidents or catastrophes end up happening. Uh, one specific instance is that has really stuck out to me though, is something called the ocean ranger. So a little bit about the unsinkable Ocean Ranger. This is a semi-submersible oil rig. And I know that in a lot of movies or media, whenever you see oil rigs, it feels like they're kind of built all the way down to the bottom of the ocean. But that's not really how most oil rigs operate, especially whenever it comes to deep sea drilling. Usually they're something called semi-submersible. Um, when... The Ocean Ranger was commissioned. It was the largest oil rig of its time. It was roughly 400 feet long, 262 feet wide, and 337 feet high, which oil rigs in general are quite large, but this was a, the largest one of its time. It was at that time uh, drilling off the uh, in the Hibernia oil fields, which was off the coast of Newfoundland. 
there were two other oil rigs in the area at the time, but they were much smaller. And that does come into play later, I promise. It was owned by a company called Odeco, but was performing drilling operations on behalf of Mobile Oil Canada. This oil rig was so large that it had the ability to operate at a maximum depth of 1,500 feet with a maximum drilling depth depth of 25,000 feet. With the semi-submersible oil rigs, though, a lot of times we kind of think of them being fixed in that one place, like I said earlier. These were able to be moved quite easily. Usually it could be either through a tow ship or a tugboat, or if it just needed to reposition itself very in a uh, a limited range, then a lot of them had built-in propulsion that they could use to move short distances. This is a diagram of what the Ocean Ranger looked like prior to its sinking. And I, I mentioned this because you'll notice there is this ballast control room on the right side that's just a little bit above the water. And you'll also see at the very bottom of it, there is a port side pontoon. There was also a starboard pontoon. Those pontoons each contained a large number of tanks in them called ballast tanks. And in order for a semi-submersible to either rise up higher in the water or sink lower in the water, they would either uh, fill them with more water or eject some of the water to control their buoyancy. And because the pontoon sits so far under the water, they were used uh, semi-submersibles were more stable than regular sea vessels, which meant that they could do the delicate drilling operations without being disturbed too much. Prior to the incident that resulted in the Ocean Ranger sinking, though, there was some early signs of danger. Uh, first and foremost, this is a chain of command diagram. Uh, and I I got this from the YouTube channel Brick and Mortar because every time I tried to draw out the diagram, it just looked horrible. And then I saw his and it looked way better. Uh, but I do want to give him credit because his videos are amazing. But the chain of command was set up in quite an interesting way. You'll notice that on the Odeco side, which is on the left side of this diagram, we had the onshore superintendent who was the direct boss for the tool pusher on the oil rig. And on the mobile oil side, we have the onshore superintendent who was the direct boss of the drilling foreman. The Odeco crew was specifically responsible for maintaining and operations of the platform itself, while the mobile crew was responsible for the drilling operations. And you'll notice over here we have Master Captain Clarence Haas. And there's that fun little question mark next to it. That's because the only thing that the Master Captain had control over was the ballast control room operators. He did not have any uh, authority over either the Odeca crew or the mobile crew. The only thing he had control over was the pontoons that were responsible for raising and lowering the submersible into the water. And as you might imagine, this kind of causes a little bit of issues, especially uh, whenever it comes to chain of command, because there are essentially two uh, superintendents on both sides, and it, it causes, this has been known to cause some issues in general. An important note about uh, Master Captain Clarence Haas, though, he has a wide range of certifications as far as being a mariner goes. He'd been in the field for a very long time, and but he was only assigned to this oil rig 19 days prior to the accident, and it was on a temporary basis. And this was because prior to joining this oil rig, he had been in a non-marina role for 10 years. So he had not been in a position to actually captain any type of crew in quite a while. And this is particularly noticeable because the week before uh, this incident that we will discuss occurred, there was a, another much smaller incident that happened where during a refueling, the captain went down to the ballast control room, relieved the operator on duty, and then took over. And he was trying to even out the uh, ballast tanks 
to adjust for the new oil or the new uh, fuel that was being taken on. But what he ended up doing was opening one of the tanks into the complete open position. So it took on water quite rapidly. And this caused a list or a lean listing in this case is when the oil rig was leaning all very heavily to one side or the other. <clears throat> This caused a list of six degrees, which is a big deal in a vessel of this size. This oil rig only had a fault tolerance of 15 degrees, which meant that if it was leaning in any direction more than 15 degrees, that was considered an irrecoverable position for it. It was probably going to go down. It's important to note, uh, this was such a big list that the crew was preparing to evacuate. They were assuming lifeboat positions because it seemed like the oil rig really might end up going down. And luckily, one of the operators kind of figured out what was going on. He called the ballast control room, talked to the captain, and then came and took control and was able to correct the issue. However, following this, nobody reported it. Neither the tool pusher or the drilling foreman said anything to their superintendents. Nobody tried to move this up the chain of command. And it, at this point, everybody was well aware that the captain had a very dangerous lack of understanding whenever it came to the ballast controls. And according to the Royal Commission on the Ocean Ranger uh, marine disaster, they found that the master on board the Ocean Ranger did not understand the control system and the tool pusher was fully aware of this. The captain even said following this that he was unfit for the position. But again, nobody took any action to try and replace him. So Prior to the oil rig actually sinking, we do have a little bit of a time of events because this was a sequence of failures that ended up happening. And it all kind of really started on February 13th in 1982. At this point, at about 2.30 a.m., they were getting some uh, reports that the wind was going to be just about 30 knots, which is going to be just under 30, 35 miles per hour. Um, the Ocean Ranger had weathered much rougher storms than this, though. In its entire career, it had only ever had to stop drilling operations one time. So at this point, they believed that there was not going to be any issues as far as the storm goes. It was likely going to cause issues for the other rigs in the area, but the Ocean Ranger at, was going to be very likely to not have any issues regarding it. At the only the only reason that they would need to stop drilling is if the waves were going to exceed 15 feet. And the reason for this being is at that point, the ballast control room sat 28 feet above the water. And once we start getting waves of about 15 feet, that's when we're going to start potentially having issues with water getting into the ballast control room, or they might need to raise up a little bit to kind of avoid that from happening. By about 1.30 p.m., another weather alert was set out, though, and this went out to all three of the oil rigs in the area. They should expect winds of 90 knots, which is going to be about 103 miles per hour, and they should also expect swells of up to 35 feet. At this point, they were predicting that the water temperatures were going to be around 29 degrees and for those of you who don't know or aren't familiar with hyperthermia, 29 degrees in water at that time of year, hypothermia is going to kick in in less than a minute usually. And once hypothermia kicks in and you're in the water, it very quickly uh, saps all of your energy and stamina. Getting into that water without proper protection is almost certainly a death sentence. By around 6.58 p.m., the tool pusher then called his boss, which was the shore-based superintendent, and explained that they were going to stop drilling and they were going to de disconnect the line because they were expecting to get waves that were going to exceed that 15 foot tolerance that they were expecting. And at this point, they were experiencing waves of 22 feet already. They knew the waves were going to get worse. And it's important to note that when disconnecting and ceasing drilling operations, they are meant to do something called deballast, which means they would. Uh, evacuate the water from the pontoon tanks and it would cause the oil rig to rise up higher in the water overall. However, this wasn't followed and it appears that at no point was that ever performed. 
which meant that for the entirety of the storm, that ballast control room was still just going to remain 28 feet above water. So as we move into February, the evening on February 14th, some of the uh, nearby oil rigs, specifically the Sedgo 706 and the Zapata, both were hit by waves that were registered to be about 70 to 80 feet high. And these were high enough that on the, I believe it was the Sedco, it completely overtook their helipad and damaged some of the structures that were on the main part of the platform. So at this point, Sedco and Zapata both deep ballasted and raised even further up into the water due to the extreme height of these waves. And at about 7.45 is when the Ocean Ranger was hit by a similar wave, ranging from 70 to 80 feet high. Now, originally, they observed that there was only minor damage to the rig. It seemed like there wasn't anything major that had been broken as a result of this. However, there were port lights. And these port lights were small, were, well, they, I say small, but they were the only windows inside of the ballast control room. And these were used so that they could visually inspect how high the ballast control room sat above the water. It was their only way to really know if any of the instrumentation was uh, misleading. During severe weather, though, these are meant to be dogged down. There were covers that were meant to be put in place to protect the actual glass, prevent it from breaking, prevent more water from getting in. However, it turns out that while there were policies about this, uh, in general, as far as the Ocean Ranger was concerned, there was no training, there were no orders to do this, nobody did it at any point. And as a result, one of the uh, port lights broke and a large flood of water came into the ballast control room. And unfortunately, the ballast control panel was not designed to be waterproof, which meant that this significantly damaged the electronics that were responsible for controlling the operations of the oil rig. It's also worth mentioning that in some of the reports, the investigators stated that even though these port light uh, covers weren't closed, they still should have been able to withstand the force of that impact. And the fact that they were broke from it was a fatal design flaw, which unfortunately we're going to see more of. So following this, there was kind of a lot of things going on at once. The ballast control panel was also responsible for communication across the oil rig. And because damage to the panel meant that they weren't able to communicate in the normal avenues, so they had to switch to using two-way radios. This meant that the nearby oil, oil rigs and their support ships would be able to overhear some of the radio chatter, and this was part of something that they overheard, and it's all valves on the port side are opening by themselves. There was some more static, and then there were valves operating something, closing or opening. The only way that they would be able to tell if the ballast uh, were opening or closing on their own would be from the lights on the control panel. If they light up or were off, it should indicate the position of each of the control tanks. However, since this was kind of going haywire at the time, they don't really know exactly what's happening if any of these ballast uh, are opening on their own or not. So at that point, the crew decides to cut power and air supply to the ballast control room. And this is pretty standard in an event such as this. And whenever that power and air supply is cut, it forces all of the valves into a closed position. And this is done for safety purposes. Now, this meant that the Ocean Ranger at that point was going to be sitting, I'm going to say at about 10 to 15, it was less than a 15 degree list at this point, uh, but it also meant that none of the ballast were taking on more water, so it was going to be stable. At, at the very least, it wasn't going to get better, but it shouldn't have gotten worse either. And investigators did determine later that if they had stayed in this state and taken no further action, 
the oil rig very likely would not have sank as a result. It's also uh, important to note that during that last phase, by the way, they did make a couple of phone calls to or uh, transmissions to the nearby ships. And at no point did they indicate that they were having any type of issue. Whenever they talked to the shore base superintendents, they said everything was fine, just minor damage. And they even radioed their support ship at one point saying, hey, are you guys doing good? We're just checking on you. We're not having any issues, which... Realistically, they probably should have indicated much earlier on that they were having some issues and because it would have put everybody in a much better position to try and respond to what is about to happen. By about 1 a.m., the crew decided to return power to the ballast control room. This was a mistake, unfortunately. The crew was untrained on some aspects of it. The captain was meant to be in control of their training and their operation, but they ended up making some decisions that were just not uh, advised. In, particularly, in particular, what they ended up doing was inserting something called construction rods. Now, these construction rods were meant to be used during construction only because it was meant to test the ballast control valves to see if they open and close. This overrides whatever control is being given by the panel itself and forces it into the open position. Unfortunately, nobody on the ballast control team understood exactly what they meant, what they did or how to use them. And so nobody knew enough to speak up and kind of speak out against it and say, maybe we shouldn't do that. It's also important to note these were never meant to be left on the oil rig to begin with. These were meant to be removed prior to it being um, deployed into the water. And the fact that they were there was a mistake uh, to begin with. So once they opened all of these valves without realizing that that is what they were doing, it resulted in the Ocean Ranger very rapidly taking on a 10 to 15 degree list. And we are very rapidly approaching that point of no recovery, like I mentioned earlier. There were also some pretty significant delays as far as distress signals go. Um, at this point, the drilling foreman called his shore base superintendent and asked him to send the mayday signal, which already is a problem because that means that there's some delay in getting out that mayday. However, that call didn't go through because of atmospheric inter uh, intervention. So it ended up getting relayed to a different operator entirely. And then that operator had to try and reach out and contact the right, uh, the superintendent. A telex was also sent out at this point, and a telex is a text message, essentially, that is used by sea vessels for uh, communication in emergencies. Unfortunately, though, this telex didn't contain a recipient, so there was no two filled, which meant that it wasn't going to be routed where it was intended to route to, and instead it ended up going to a operator in Connecticut. At no point in this message was the word mayday used. So it was not formatted in a way that would properly indicate the severity of this incident. Fortunately, though, the operator decided to forward and escalate this issue anyways, because despite the lack of mayday and it not being in the proper format and it didn't, it, it just was all wrong to relay that a, sh a vessel was going down. Uh, they ended up forwarding it. It went to the U.S. Coast Guard in New York, who then phoned the RCC Halifax, which was the proper rescue center for the Hibernia oil fields. But this did cause a significant delay in trying to get uh, effort into the area to rescue these, these crew members. And it's also important to note that there is a 24-hour monitored station for vessels to try and contact in case of an emergency and at no point was that done. There are a few more design flaws that played into the very rapid sinking 
of the Ocean Ranger. In particular, there is the life raft design. Now, these were designed to have a arm that would swing out and away from the oil rig. And I don't know if anybody's actually watching my camera right now, but I have, it's meant to swing out like that. But unfortunately, one of them was already underwater by this point. There was no way to access that life raft and there was no way to deploy it, which also meant that the life rafts on the other side of the oil rig were dangerously high in the air and there was no way to force that arm to swing out and away from the vessel, which meant that if they somehow did manage to deploy it, it was likely going to hit parts of the columns on the way down, which would significantly damage the integrity of any of the lifeboats. It is also important to mention that at no location on the Ocean Ranger were there weather suits that were meant for oil or uh, ocean rescues. These are meant to protect uh, sailors or crew members who end up in these dangerously cold waters that uh, it protects them from the elements and can kind of help increase their survivability until rescue gets there. Somehow they did manage to um, deploy the one that was dangerously high above water, but unfortunately it did end up hitting part of the column on the way down and it tore a hole in the side of the raft. And while there was a support ship that was seven miles away, by the time they had made it there, there was only the one life raft that had roughly 30 people in it and their support vessel was not uh, configured or equipped to retrieve a life raft from the water. And because of the large hole that was torn in the side of the life raft, it ended up sinking before anybody could get there to get them out of the water. My slide didn't want to move forward. Um, so by about 3 a.m., radar contact was lost with the Ocean Ranger, which at that point it was determined to have fully sank. So uh, on the morning of February 15th, 1982, all 84 souls aboard the Ocean Ranger unfortunately lost their lives. And by 3.38 a.m., this information was relayed to the mobile shore offices captains and the rescue ships in the area assumed that that information would also be forwarded to search and rescue. However, that was not done until 7.35 a.m. So that meant that the search teams that were being sent to the area were looking for an upright oil rig when really what it was is it had completely capsized and this was the one of the last pictures taken of the Ocean Ranger. The, this is the bottom of the pontoons that were responsible for raising and lowering the oil rig into the water. So as you can see, it had completely flipped upside down and the rescuers were not aware to look for that. And you might be thinking, okay, that's an interesting story, Jennifer, but really what does that have to do with cheese? Uh, and I'll tell you what it does. First of all, here is just a small uh, section of one of the many reports that I read. Specifically, this one's from the U.S. Coast Guard report. Uh, and you'll notice the highlighted section says, this chain of events was not an, inev an inevitable progression and could have been broken by competent human intervention. What they found was that every failure or design flaw along the way, had there been some form of competent interaction on behalf of the crew, very likely the Ocean Ranger would not have sank. Which brings us to the Swiss cheese model of failure. And I am a huge fan of this model for a lot of different reasons. And it, it kind of, one of the ways that, that started as many years ago, I had heard somebody refer to our memory as being like Swiss cheese. And sometimes those holes line up just right for us to do something uh, that could be potentially catastrophic to us or those around us. So the idea is that no layer of security or protection is 100%. We're always going to have those small holes or gaps. And sometimes they line up just right for 
catastrophe to happen. This was a model introduced by a uh, a man called James T. Reason. He has a series of books that I do recommend reading if you are in any way interested in organizational accidents. Uh, I found uh, organizational accidents revisited to be absolutely riveted, riveting, but he also has some other more like entry-level books like Life and Error that kind of talk about human uh, interaction and how we end up performing or how we end up in these situations where catastrophe occurs, such as a nuclear power plant meltdown, or uh, in this case, the oil rig that ended up sinking. And in each of these accidents, there's a few things that were consistent across the board. In particular, latent conditions and active failures. These um, It's important to note that whenever it comes to latent conditions, there's not an active failure necessary in order for these to have an effect. They're more like pathogens that kind of combine with other local triggers and they will then open up an event trajectory. Usually these require a gap in security to line up just right. And this is going to be something like if there's a man trap where you're supposed to use a key card to go through both sides, maybe it's something where you get in the habit of opening the door for the delivery man without asking him to sign in or cost-cutting shortcuts that we all sometimes take. There's uh, a couple of important things to note about it. The effects from the, the latent conditions, they tend to last longer. They tend to be much broader issue, and they're a lot harder to fix because they usually are embedded to, into a company culture in some way. And they are also present prior to an adverse event happening. These are just small cracks in the defensive wall. They aren't gaping holes. Conversely, we have active failures, and these are unsafe acts, and they fall into two main categories. There are the error-based or the violations, and errors are skill-based slips. They have the rule-based slips where maybe you weren't trained properly, so you you make a mistake in trying to follow a procedure, or knowledge-based mistakes. I think we are all guilty of thinking we know more than we actually do sometimes, and we can act on that knowledge that we believe is correct, that is actually incorrect. So, for example, whenever on the Ocean Ranger, their decision to insert the construction rods would have been a knowledge-based mistake. They didn't understand what they were doing, and they did it anyways. And then we also have the violations, routine, cutting corners. These are sometimes thrill-seeking or optimization. Maybe we're going to skip a few steps in our normal routine to kind of try to speed things up. Sometimes we're doing these because leadership is really pushing down on us to try and get us to do stuff faster. Sometimes they're viewed as necessary in such cases where you need to do a specific task, but technically to do that task, you need this other item, but that other item doesn't exist. So you just go do the task anyways and kind of do your best to fill the gaps around it. And finally, there's also the exceptional. Sometimes uh, those are mostly going to be a case by case basis. And I do want to share a story of a failure on my behalf from whenever I was first getting started in cybersecurity. One, because I I know that some people, you look at others and you think, wow, that, you know, they probably are on top of it and they always have it. And two, because I think by sharing my mistakes and my failures, people can learn from it and then they can start to if whenever they make that mistake they can also understand okay I know that this I messed this up this is how I can grow from it and I just I like to keep that transparency um whenever I first started in the SOC uh we were responsible for monitoring traffic for a lot of different companies and we had one company that uh they had administrator logins from outside of the their normal network. And usually these were going to be through a VPN or something like that. And they wanted to be informed when they, those happened, but it wasn't like a critical thing. It was for their case, mostly just audit purposes to know when an administrator was signing in to do some work. Um, they were based out of the United States. And I knew that uh, all of their workforce was based out of the United States. and we would easily get between 10 to 20 of these administrator logon alerts throughout the day. And the protocol was just 
fill in the information, say which administrator it was, where they signed in from, and send them the email, and that was it. And then one day we had a administrator sign in from China. And that immediately should have set off alarm bells for me. But I had gotten so used to the, okay, an administrator signed in from outside the network, fill in the information, send the email. So fortunately, we did send an email saying that it had happened. But realistically, we should have escalated that immediately. Uh, what ended up happening was it was a threat actor and they did compromise them and put malware on a machine which turned into a big deal, we we had protocol for when something like that happened. And it was called critical and call. And then if I noticed it, I should have stopped what I was doing. I should have called my point of contact at the company and let them know that it happened. But I had gotten so into that repetitive copy the username, copy the IP address, send the email anywhere between 10 to 20 times a day that when something was just slightly out of the ordinary i didn't notice it and those are the examples of the latent conditions and active failures when we are repeating these tasks over and over and over again that they become mindless that's when we enter the territory of potentially making massive mistakes And you're probably like, okay, well, you've explained the oil and you've explained the cheese. Does this actually really apply to cybersecurity? And the answer is yes. Um, no compromise takes place in a vacuum. It is a series of events, just like an organizational accident. A compromise is when the holes in security lines up just right for something to happen. And I'm going to give my favorite example of this just because it's been so well documented, but because it very clearly shows the wide range of latent conditions, active failures, and how they apply to cybersecurity as a whole. I don't know if anybody remembers when Microsoft had that big Azure breach and it's because a, an engineer's account was hacked. Other failures along the way, including a signing key improperly appearing in a crash dump. This wasn't a, oh, everything was compromised just one day. It was, there was a series of events that had to happen in order for this to occur. So particularly very at the very beginning of this, we had an engineer's corporate account that was compromised. And as a result of this, the attacker got access to a debugging environment. And in this debugging environment, there happened to be a crash dump from 2021, which was quite a bit before the compromise actually occurred. Now, in these crash dumps, um, which is just for those of you who don't know, it is going to be a massive output of logs and errors and other information when something breaks so that you can try to go in and troubleshoot it. Now, there were controls in place to prevent uh, keys or the, or the Azure keys from being recorded in these crash dumps. So that way, some form of uh, protection around them occurred. Unfortunately, though, there was a race condition, which meant the key was still present in that one specific crash dump in that debugging environment that the one corporate engineer had access to. Also, because it was a debugging environment, they had not installed uh, sufficient logging and monitoring around this environment, because a lot of times companies look at it and think, okay, well, debugging, it's not that big of a deal. Who really wants to go there? Um, so they had no logs to see if any data exfiltration was happening or that anything suspicious might have occurred. And then there was also a completely separate zero day it, that would allow enterprise email access by using a regular consumer key. So as a user myself, if I provided my own key, I could still probably get access to a massive corporation. And so all of that combined together leading to a massive Azure breach. And whenever we're, we're thinking about the Swiss cheese model of error, there's really, there's the attacker perspective, and then there's also a defensive perspective, and it, it does apply to both sides. And I am going to uh, 
give an example of something that I do very frequently at work. It's we do architecture reviews. I do risk assessments and they are thought experiments. At the end of the day, I am looking at a specific product a company wants to implement and I'm saying, okay, what are the controls around this? What happened if all those controls went away tomorrow? What happens if that service is compromised? What happens if there's an insider threat? And I'm trying to identify all of the potential ways that this specific service could impact the company in a negative manner. And I'm going to be honest, sometimes you feel a little bit ridiculous doing it. I'm looking at, you know, uh, a password manager, manager, and it's like, okay, well, what if there's a third party compromise? What if somebody just reuses the same password over and over again? And you feel a little bit goofy doing it, but it's still important to kind of get in the practice of doing that because it helps you identify vulnerabilities or flaws in your own organization. But while we're doing this, ask yourself, what are the bells or what are what is it that's going to set alarm bells off for you? For the example I gave earlier, again, that administrator login from outside of the United States should have set off an alarm bell for me. And especially when we're looking at our routine, the things that we're doing over and over and over again, what is it in that process that sets off an alarm bell? Because if we can identify what it is, even in those repetitive motions, if it comes up, we'll be more likely to notice it rather than going through those motions. What are five things that could go wrong with this? And can you identify the cracks in the defensive wall before they are exploited? And something that I, I, I kind of like to compare it to is uh, I think a lot of us have probably heard uh, your parents at some point say, you know, stop and think. And it's they never really told you what to think about. They're just like, you should be thinking. And it's like, well, okay, well, but what am I thinking about? Because I could be thinking about lots of things. It's just, what is it that you think I'm being dumb about this time? And really what we're thinking about in this case is what are the latent conditions in your organization? What are your latent conditions? And are there any active failures that you can observe going on? And as far as the attacker's perspective goes, I always kind of like to share this story whenever it comes to it, because again, no compromise happens in a vacuum. It is whenever a an attacker is able to line up those holes in security just right for a compromise to happen. Um, one of the things that I kind of try to press on newer pen testers that I'm trying to help train or teach is you need to be doing some research as we go. But we have a, a tendency to over rely on tools like Nessus or the Burp Active Scan. And I'm going to be completely honest, every time I've ever found one of these really cool hacks that had something really awesome at the end of it, <clears throat> it wasn't because Nessus told me, oh, there's a SQL injection there. Or, oh, this is, you know, probably vulnerable to cross site scripting. Instead, what it is, is Nessus gives me this medium finding of browsable web directories. And I'm going to go look at those browsable web directories to see if maybe there's some more information I can learn about the underlying system. And very recently, I found one where I could see that they were running MySQL. Okay, not a big deal. Uh, I actually happen to be quite familiar with MySQL. So let's keep looking around. And then I find that there's a connection.php. And having had to manage MySQL before, I, I was pretty sure that if I was able to get access to that, I was going to get access to the database location and then the username and password to connect to it. And sure enough, that's exactly what was in there. Now, this was just a general dashboard database that it was connecting to. It didn't have anything that should have been considered privileged. It was something that was all public knowledge. It was just statistics as far as the organization was concerned. But once I signed into it, I did notice that there was a couple of other databases hosted there that I still had access to as the, uh, I think it was like dash dev uh, admin or something like that. There were some other tables that I had access to. And a particular note to me was the um, HR system that was also hosted there. And so I was able to then go and look at all of the employee information. And this included their employee ID, their direct supervisor, their direct supervisor's employee ID, which office they were located at and all of that. And that's a large amount of information to have, uh, especially since this engagement had a social engineering component. So, 
I didn't have the permission to add my own account into it just because of the type of account that I was using to access the information. So instead what I did is I called uh, one of the tech support people and pretended like I was an employee trying to get a password reset. And fortunately, I had all of the information that they asked of me to verify that I was indeed Sarah Parker uh, located at like Roosevelt office. I had my employee ID. I knew my supervisor. I knew my supervisor's employee ID and I was able to give them all that information and get them to reset a password for me over the phone. Uh, so that is one of those examples of the times that all of these little bits of information line up just right for me to be able to successfully compromise a company. And finally, uh, as we close this out, before I move on to taking any questions or anything like that, I just want to take a moment to state that there is a memorial in Newfoundland for all of the souls that were lost aboard the Ocean Ranger. And I just wanted to call attention to that because I know that while the story might be interesting to me and that I do enjoy talking about this in the Swiss cheese model of error, it's important to note that a lot of the rules and regulations for those industries were written in blood and that real people were involved. And so, um, does anybody have any questions about this? And that includes you, Kevin. I know. I just, I always <laughs> think this is awesome. And I, to me, one of the things that I, when you first started talking about the Swiss cheese model, which again, like we said at the very beginning, I like cheese. Um, <laughs> it really made me think about all of the different places all of the different places that InfoSec impacts this type of thing mm -hmm. or is impacted by this type of thing. And that, but I, I don't know, I think it's cool, so. Yes, and you know, I think that it's really easy to kind of look at something like this and say, oh, well, you know, that's oil rigs. Of course, whenever they have those accidents, like yeah. that's a much bigger catastrophe, but we're still dealing with lives, it's yep. just, whenever it happens to us in this field, it's not as, there's not as much blood. Um, there very rarely is, but there, yeah. there are examples of poor planning or poor configuration actually leading to people dying in IT, which is weird to think about. But I think one of them was like the Thorac uh, radiation machine where a software bug yeah. and then an a exploit being used by the nurses resulted in people receiving dangerously high levels of radiation. Yeah, that one, uh, we, you and I were just talking about that because that yeah. book I read, Humble Pie, which was P-I, not P-I-E, <laughs> even though I like pie. Um, and yeah, that it was, it's interesting. So I, I uh, man, I, I think this was great. I think we can wrap up a little a little early and, and let everybody enjoy themselves. Uh, I'm going to say thank you very much, Jennifer. That was excellent. I really appreciate you, you knocking this out. Thank um, you. Everybody enjoy yourself. We'll have another one of these, you know, same bat place, same bat time or something in the future. I'm sure Jeannie has the next one scheduled already. Um, <laughs> yeah, she usually just, does. I know she schedules them quite far out. Uh, yeah. I'm not I, quite great as great at calendars as she is. I mostly just wait until somebody tells me to go to do a certain thing at a certain yeah, time. <laughs> sure. Go here now. Do that yep. thing. Yeah, I can do that. So I will say if anybody is going to be at Show Me Con in uh, May, Jennifer will be in St. Louis and uh, yes, she'll be out there. And, I'm actually uh, keynoting Show Me Con and we'll have a booth. So and I think yeah, you're presenting and, as well, right? Yeah, me and Kathy Collins will be presenting on yep. um, a pretty similar. We're going to expand a little bit more on the Swiss cheese model of error and the actual thought process behind it. But we, it's a, we have a, chosen a different story to tell at the very beginning of it and it's about um i don't remember exactly what it was but it was i think we called it like old issues new brandy or something like that i think it's about <laughs> like a whiskey fire or something yeah yeah awesome so cool everybody i'm gonna stop the recording and we will talk to you later thank you <laughs>